we go. Welcome dinosaurs. I'm personally really glad to be here. I hear that this is an up and coming conference. Is that true? Okay, and I hear that you guys write a pretty popular language called JavaScript, right? Is that like Java? Do you get that sometimes? You're like, I write JavaScript. And they're like, oh, I took Java in college. And you're like, eh, that's nothing to do with what I do. <laughs> I have a uh, slide deck that you can download here. That's the most popular question after any presentation. Are those slides going to be available online? Yes. Yes, they are. Uh, so that's where you can download this. Uh, I have a bit of a hybrid presentation. I'm going to be doing some soft topic. I'm kind of at that stage in my career where I'm starting to feel and look old. I'm not like punch card old, but I'm floppy disk old. And I feel obligated to give like dad advice, like unsolicited advice. So I'm going to do a bit of soft topic, but I also love coding and I can't quite stand to just do soft topic. So I'm just going to like change gears and put it into high at one point and I'm actually going to show code and do something crunchy, okay? So it won't just be soft. But we're going to talk about tech. And specifically, we're going to talk about your tech career, your tech life and career. But first, a little bit about me. I've been doing this a long time, like I said. I work at Microsoft as a, as a software engineer, mostly in evangelism, however, talking a lot to other people. I always say the only thing I like more than writing code is talking about writing code. And it's still true. You can find me online at Code Foster. I do like to stay in touch with the developer community, so feel free to contact me. I like to be nice and open. Here's my email address. You can email me. I don't promise an immediate reply, but I love putting that out there. In fact, there's my phone number, my social, there's my private SSH key. No, <laughs> no secrets, people, no secrets, OK? Now, I came from aerospace. I did a lot of software development on the Boeing 787 project. I got to work on the sister project, the Airbus 350. It was actually a little bit fun. I was working on both projects at the same time, Boeing and Airbus. Uh, I also got to work up in Boulder for a little while on the Hubble and on the James Webb Space Telescope. But I also taught middle school. Now, you want to talk about an absolutely unruly room full of utter anarchy you should go to a hackathon, because that's what I do now. No, worse than middle schoolers is hackathons, and, and, and yet we love them. And we, and we go to hackathons, and we write a lot of code, and that's our culture, and that's a lot of fun. Now, we're not here because of that. I'm not, I wasn't invited, I don't believe, to speak at Dinosaur JS because of that. I think I was invited to speak because of my paleontolo paleontological background, not my aerospace background. This is me as a seven-year-old. My dad is an excavator. And one day, driving a scraper, actually here in Colorado, he dug up a dinosaur. And he said, I'm, my son Jeremy's into dinosaurs. I'm going to take him to the job site. And I, with my paleontological expertise, quickly identified it as an allosaurus. All right? That's an allosaurus there in the ground. Now, the museum experts came out, and they said it was a horse. But I think that it's clear. <laughs> That that's an allosaurus, and I'm sticking with it. And I think it's official. I showed a dinosaur at Dinosaur JS. So I think we're good. OK, so here's what we're going to do. First, I'm going to talk about your life and career. And I'm going to do this in a way that we all kind of feel familiar with. So I'm going to do this as modules. So the first module, actually, .mjs, I think the general consensus is we don't like .mjs. So let's just call that .js. And actually, I like dashes, so let's do dashes. OK, so there we go. Yourlifeandcareer.js. We'll do module one. And I'm going to deliver a little bit of soft content about your life and career in the form of three modules. Education, experience, and inspiration. Sounds soft, sounds fluffy. But there's some real meat in there that I think is good for all of us. And then. Like I said, like I promised, I'm going to make it crunchy, and I'm going to talk about RxJS, an observable library for JavaScript. Now, I'm going to start with education, experience, and inspiration. And so first, we're going to zoom in on education. Education is the input of your life and career. This is the data dump where, regardless of how you do it, regardless of the form factor, 
you have chosen to embark on a very technical career, a career in creating software. And did you guys know that software is the most complicated thing that mankind has ever made? More complicated than any single one of our, our manned space missions is the software. In fact, most of those manned space, space missions are made up much of software. So this is a very, very technical career, and there's gonna be a lot of stuff that you have to get into your head. And whether you do that with a classic education at university, or a code school, or entirely self-taught, there's gonna be some data dumps. So we've gotta talk about that input, all right? So first of all, I'm gonna encourage you guys to be voracious learners. I remember when Java was released. Who can say that? I remember when Java was invented. Yeah, a few hands. Some admitting. And I, it was the thing. I mean, you could write your code and run it anywhere the Java VM could run. It's gonna be in your car, on your dash, in your refrigerator, it's gonna be everywhere. And I was terribly motivated to learn Java. And I remember on vacation at midnight, in bed, with a three and a half inch book, an introduction to the Java programming language, reading this book from cover to cover because I had to know how to do this. If you count on your day at work, learning on the job, you're gonna find yourself always behind. You'd better be a voracious learner. You'd better be always striving to learn more and not counting on uh, the daylight hours to learn that. Be an intentional learner. We tend sometimes to just learn the things that we happen to be a bit interested in or happen to fall on our plate, happen to land in front of us, and we put too much of our input in the hands of happenstance, and, and I don't think that's wise. I think we need to be very intentional and even strategic about what it is that we get into our heads. Look on the horizon, where is the software industry going? What are the big things? I'll tell you what I think are some of the big things coming down the road. One of the ones I think is absolutely huge, I would say IoT, except that's kind of already on us, and we kind of already know how huge that is, but another one, blockchain. Man, absolutely massive. Machine learning, but once again, we know that machine learning is huge. We know that it's a thing, and it's kind of already here. But some of these things are on the horizon, but if they're not in your daily stuff, you might kind of miss them. You might kind of pass them up. But be intentional, put them on your calendar. As soon as you know that blockchain's important, put a block on your calendar and say, this is where I'm gonna learn blockchain. This is where I'm gonna figure out what this is all about, and now I'm gonna actually pr uh, practice with it and play with some code, okay? Very, very important. You, uh, you also need to be able to press through ambiguity. When you are voraciously learning, when you are intentionally learning, you'll find yourself in spaces where you go, you know what, I don't get this. This whole blockchain thing, what's, what's the big deal? How is this different than a regular old database? You just don't get it, and that's the ambiguity. I call it the primordial ooze, when you're just like, nothing's gelling, nothing's making sense. And I challenge you to press on in those moments, because in those moments, you're actually not only learning something, even though you don't feel like it, but you're also expanding your mind. Because those are the times when new concepts are landing. The fact that you don't quite get it yet is, is exactly because it is a new concept coming to you, okay? So be really tenacious about that. Make sure that you are, are um, uh, pressing through even when it's hard. I challenge you to be a humble learner. I'll date myself again. 20 years ago, I was answering tech support calls at Gateway Computers. Gateway Computers, the cows, that's right. And I was working in a large call center with a bunch of other geeks. And we're talking black t-shirts with dragons, there's you know, truckloads of Mountain Dews coming in, and it's, it was very stereotypical. And I realized that when, when just kind of shooting the breeze in the break rooms and stuff, there were two kinds of people that worked there in that tech center, in that call center. There were the guys who were trying to reinforce the fact that they knew everything. And there were the guys that were okay with the fact that they didn't know everything, and they were asking questions of other people. And I realized that day that the latter are the ones that are still learning. They're the ones that are still getting new information and the other ones aren't. They're stuck unless they go find things because they're not learning something uh, every day. See, humility is not a low view of yourself, it's a right view of yourself. That's the real definition of humility. So you need to 
figure out where you are, and if that's early in your career, great. If it's somewhere in the middle of your career, that's great. But figure out where you really are and be honest and be humble about that. Super important. You need to be a perpetual learner. I want you to today have in mind yourself at 70, 80, whatever years old, going to those continuing education classes at the local community college. Because you, your whole life, have been committed to learning, and you're still learning, all right? Imagine yourself as a perpetual learner, and don't assume that this is just something that happens before you start working. You have to be a perpetual learner. Okay, zoom out, that's the input, that's what goes into our heads, but then it comes out our fingertips. And as coders, it literally comes out of our fingertips, right? That's the experience part. You've gotta actually go apply, you've gotta actually go do. See, you're going to university or code school or internet, and you're learning all this stuff, and you're, they're, they're making you into a tool, some more than others, but they're making you into a tool, <laughs> and, and then you've gotta go, hammer the nails. You've got to go apply that. See, you learn all the theory, you learn all of the ideal way of doing things in school, and then reality hits you. And it's time to go make an API and secure it. And you're like, oh man, I don't know how to do this. I've got to secure this thing. I, I've, got to, I've got this to actually work. I've got for this to actually work in order to fulfill my role. And it's actually beating your head against the wall and doing something wrong over and over that that ends up teaching you. You'll, you'll find that the difference between a seasoned programmer and a new programmer is that a seasoned programmer is able to just see what it is that isn't working without starting the debugger. He goes, that's not right. How does he know that? Because it's kept him up at night many, many nights. And now it's perfectly clear. He can see that, no problem. So we're gonna have to work hard in order to apply this technical stuff. And I like to say, that we should always be going to bed tired. That's my little personal mantra, and by that I mean I'm, I wanna wake up early, I wanna work hard all day, I don't wanna have any of those days where I didn't accomplish very much in the day, even if the accomplishment was I did it wrong eight times, right? That's a huge accomplishment. My friend always says, I reduced failure space today. <laughs> I figured out eight ways it should not be done, and that's really valuable. See, for me, it's not just about working hard, it's about trying to focus those efforts and do the right things. I always say the hardest thing I do all day is focus, and I'm not talking about like the DOM element on focus event. I mean like focus on my task and make sure that the next thing that I'm working on is the best thing I can work on. How do you do that? How do you figure out what is the best thing that you can work on? Well, you're gonna have to figure out what it is that you should be working on by creating and, and refining and honing a personal mission statement. You have to figure out what it is that means success at the end of the week or at the end of the year. Otherwise, you're just wandering and you don't know what success is. You can't let your employer tell you what success is. He tells you what your job is. You can't let circumstances tell you what success is. You've gotta be working towards something and only you can determine what that is. It is a default that each of us is a digital consumer. That's easy. It's easy to play Xbox. It's easy to watch Netflix. It's easy to consume digital content that's created by others. But I want you to be a digital producer. And you are, as a coder, you are both creative and you're an engineer and you're making things in the digital space. And we need everybody to bring their authentic self as a digital producer to this space. Look at, for a second, look at Microsoft's mission statement. Now, now, this has changed a bit over the years. It's simplified, I believe, and it is simply to empower people and organizations to achieve more. That's a really general statement, but now Microsoft as a company has something that they can measure their efforts up against. And you should, you should do the same thing. Now, once you've created your mission statement, you default to no. Somebody asks you to do something, no, 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 no. Oh wait, this, this lines up with my personal mission statement. My personal mission statement is to inform and to inspire. I wanna be a part of this education where I relay information because that's fulfilling for me, that's the way I'm made. And I also want to be somebody who inspires and gives us reason to use the things uh, that we learn. One trick for me, this is, these are kind of the pro-life tips, is to remove decision fatigue. 
See, it's not just about doing more of the good. We have to figure out how to do less of the bad, because the bad pulls us away from all the things that we should be doing to fulfill our personal mission statements. Decision fatigue is something that was really crippling for me. I would spend significant amounts of blurry time in the morning trying to figure out what I was going to wear until I finally followed Mark Zuckerberg's advice and I bought 10 copies of the same shirt. And now I just wake up and I put the shirt on. And I don't have to think about it anymore. And, and people go, well, that's really boring. I, I want to make a statement. I want to wear a shirt that says something. And I go, well, that, yeah, me too, every once in a while. And that's, so then I put that shirt on. But if I don't have any reason to make a statement or wear a color, I just put on the shirt. I just put on the gray shirt. And that's really, really helpful for me. Another thing that's helpful for me is Soylent. Anybody else is a fan of Soylent? I did Soylent for a whole month and it was awesome. I did nothing but Soylent and water. And I learned so much about food in that one month. I learned that there's a lot of ceremony around food. Somewhere around 10 o'clock, you're like, what are we going to do for lunch today? I don't know. What do you want to do for lunch today? Why is it that nobody knows what they want to eat? And we all come together and we ask each other, what do we want to eat? I don't know. Let's see what Jill wants to eat. Jill doesn't care. All right, so we end up walking down the street, finding a place, ordering, waiting in line, eating, cleaning up after ourselves, and then trying to find our context at work again. There's all this ceremony around it. And people say about this too, oh, I'm a foodie. I don't, I don't want to give up food and just have soil. That's boring. And I go, well, I'm a foodie too. I mean, I had a caramel brownie last night. But that's an expression. Like, there was a reason for it. And sometimes I want to go out to lunch with my friends. And, and when I do, I, I do. But when I don't care and I'm like in the middle of my API and I'm thinking about that operation and then my stomach growls, I just go, chug. And then I just keep on going. Okay? I've just removed some of the stuff that blocks me from my personal mission statement from getting those things done. OK, so input into the head, output through the fingertips, the education and the experience. But this is all fueled by inspiration. Okay, the Inspiration is what gives you the energy, the power to actually get the stuff done. Because you can be really well educated and really well practiced and know how to do it. But if you don't care, you don't care. See, some days you wake up, and it's like this. <laughs> you just feel like that. And then it doesn't matter how much you know, and it doesn't matter how good you are at it. If you don't have the inspiration, you don't have any fuel whatsoever. Education, you can just go pay for learning. And experience, you can just go find a job and practice. You can even practice on your own at home. But how do you get inspired? How do you do that? A couple tips. First, make sure that you're tapped into the local developer community. Because developers don't write code alone. We write code together in community. That's really important. Relationship matters in every facet of life. We don't have an exception. There's no such thing as the basement developer. No such thing as him. <laughs> so the community, I like to visualize by looking at this. Has anybody seen this? Nobody whatsoever. This is really fascinating. A member of the community scraped NPM, and as well as all the other uh, package stores, and he built a constellation, a star chart, of all of the packages in a star field. And he did it in WebGL. And you can go fly through it, browse around it. You can interact with it. The way this works is really fascinating. It's a little bit hard to see on this screen. But I actually interviewed the guy who did this. And that, that link will take you to the, the uh, interview. And then there's a link to the actual uh, star chart. But this shows this whole community. This is a force-directed graph where all of the packages want to repel each other and get blown out into space. But there's an attractive force where, where there's a dependency between one package and another. And that holds them together. And so if, if you visit that and fly around, you'll be able to see the larger stars because they are, uh, they are rendered larger when they have more things that are dependent on them. And you'll look at a big one, and you'll zoom into it, and you'll hover over it, and it'll say, oh, that's request, or oh, that's low dash. And you're like, oh, wow. That's that's really interesting. And so this visualizes this community called NPM. And, and this is this community of developers working together. And you get to see these little 
clusters of people that are working together in there. And I find that really fascinating. I have this theory I call general inspiration, which for me is really encouraging because it means that I can go watch somebody play a violin and then I can go write a book. Or I can read somebody, somebody's book and I can go play the violin. Not me specifically, but, but general inspiration in my mind is this fact that somebody can inspire me through their own medium and then I can apply that in my own particular way. And, and that's encouraging because there are a lot of things that I find inspiring that I don't have the practice and skill to do. But we have to do this together. See, this inspiration, it, it gets shared inductively. Do you guys know how inductors work? If you're, if you're a software guy, sometimes you haven't done so much with hardware, but, but some have. But the wall warts that you have at home that, that turn the AC110 into something that your phone doesn't blow up with, is, is really just a transformer inside, and a transformer takes advantage of inductance. There's no wires actually touching between the AC network and your phone. No wires whatsoever. There's a coil of wire and another coil of wire, and the coil of wire called the primary coil, that's the one attached to the AC network, has this, like, heartbeat. See, DC is just flat. There's no change. It doesn't induce anything because there's no change. But AC, you guys probably know, goes back and forth. It breathes like our hearts, like our lungs. And with that change, with that heartbeat, is, is a constant expanding and collapsing of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's how we, all of our communication is done. That's the reason you have Wi-Fi and cell phones and Bluetooth. It's all this breathing into the, the electromagnetic spectrum. And then the secondary coil on the other side picks that up. And that's really an analogy for the way inspiration works between you and other developers in your community. It's important for you to stand up in front of others or in personal relationship to influence others, to share this heartbeat and pick this heartbeat up from other people. That's the way that we fuel each other. You should also, and this is getting really soft, but tap into natural beauty, the natural beauty that's around us. See, we tend to just get all technical and ignore this holistic view that, that the, the beauty in nature around us is unavoidable and it influences all of us. I like to think about the guy who's highly technical and he's sitting on his couch watching cable and he's tuning into the Discovery Channel. It's funny because it's highly technical, but he still wants to go look at trees. There's still a market for Discovery Channel and, and Animal Planet, right? And and yet, how long ago was the incandescent light bulb invented? And yet, you can still go to the mall and buy candles? Because people are human, and they like fire. They like the reality of fire. I like to think of beauty not so much as attractiveness, as severity. That's, that's my own personal view of it. And I've actually not really experienced anything, I don't think, as beautiful as one trip in the middle of the ocean where I was watching a sun, the sun, a sun, the sun rise for like three hours. And I had no idea the sun rose for like three hours. And it was just me in the middle of the ocean. It was really amazing in this supposedly stark environment. And sometimes, um, sometimes we get to apply that explicitly in our coding careers, and other times it's a little bit more um, <clears throat> within us. But I think that ultimately we like being reminded how small we are. And then that takes us back to the being a humble learner, where we like being reminded that we are a little part of a big machine called software development moving forward, called the JavaScript community, or the Node community, or the greater developer community. So that's my view of your life and career in the form of education, experience, and inspiration. I hope that's helpful. And I have three minutes to introduce you to something crunchy. We gotta, I've got to raise it back up because the next talk is going to be talking about the V8 engine. And I'm like, we've, we've got to have a little bit of a transition here between like natural beauty and, and code. So I want to talk about RxJS. RxJS is, in my experience, one of these expressions of one of my passions in code. Uh, it is a observable implementation. We all probably know the observable pattern, the pub-sub pattern, very popular, very important. Uh, the RxJS library is that plus a whole bunch more. It's kind of a big collection of operators that allow you to think and work in a new way 
in the form of streams. I've got these two projects on my mind. One that I worked on last fall, and it's, I'm still kind of maintaining, uh, is this is a, a terribly difficult diagram to understand because I'm not an artist. But on the bottom here are these very popular water rowing machines. And these are all over the place. They're in every orange theory in the country. And I put a Raspberry Pi on these and connected them up to the cloud. And, and then I created a UI and a, an application so that whenever somebody's rowing, they're able to get into a group setting and either do a race or a collaborative rowing session. And I want you, in this application, to visualize the data flowing to the cloud and virtually flowing between these machines and the UI by way of the cloud. Now I'm going to show you one more project. This is one that I'm working on right now. So I'm working on little Raspberry Pis that are on a boat that are relaying information again to the cloud, either by way of a land connection, if it happens to have one, or a satellite connection for a low uh, uh, block level fee, if applicable. And I'm trying to synchronize this data. And once again, I want you to see that what we have here is a flowing of data. We have data flowing all over the place. We have streams. We have the classic uh, stream paradigm. And then we have a UI based on this. Now, for managing these streams, we have imperative ways to do it. But a library like RxJS fills a niche that I think a lot of developers are not uh, necessarily tuned into yet. So what I want to do is I want to show you a diagram here. And I want you to imagine the type that fulfills this quadrant, synchronous scalar types. This is really just a type. It's a string or it's a integer, it's a um, whatever. It's a scalar type, meaning there's just one. It's not an array. And it's synchronous, meaning that it is uh, created immediately and available immediately. And then we have need to create multiple things. We have need to move into the vector space. And so in the vector space, we have an array, right? We create an array. That's what fulfills that space. And I apologize if that's a little bit difficult to uh, read. And that's also synchronous, even though it's an array. You have to, if you're going to consume an array, you have to consume it in memory right now. And sometimes that's really, really difficult. Now, in the asynchronous space, in the scalar quadrant, what do we have? We have promises, right? Promises are asynchronous, which is wonderful, but they're also scalar. So what do we have in that top quadrant? What is it that we have that gives us the multiples? It gives us that, that vector, but it's also asynchronous. And we've tried a number of things over the years. Uh, some of you have experimented with solutions that involve arrays of promises, or promises that return an array, or generators, or callbacks. There's lots of attempts at asynchrony. But even the most common, popular, modern way of doing asynchrony, which is promises, are really just returning one thing. And so up here, we have observables. And this is the space for ReactiveJS. ReactiveJS is really just an implementation of reactive extensions, which is available in a whole lot of languages, which is really cool because people like Netflix have picked up RxJS. And Netflix uses extensively on the server in Java and on the client in JavaScript. And the same programmers can go work on the same concepts on both the client and the server because it's the same on both. And the Reactive JS gives you the ability, I'm going to kind of flip through here because I'm a little bit short on time, to have a stream of things and yet recognize the timing and to do some interesting things like the merging of two streams. So you can visualize there how you can take two streams of things and then adhering to the original timing, you can create a third thing. We can do the distinct operator. We can filter out streams of things. And so we can program our stuff in a whole new paradigm, a whole new way of doing things that is very expressive, very terse, and very functional. So that was a little bit of an awkward transition into something more technical. But that is RxJS. If you guys haven't seen it, if it's not on your radar, hopefully it will be. Hopefully the, uh, the kind of the soft topic helps you guys a little bit. I'm Jeremy Foster. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for joining me in Jen's Corner. Mm, Jen's Corner. Yeah. So um, I really like that you touched upon the fact that like, no one learns alone. Like, I wholeheartedly believe that like, building software is a human experience. Um, 
And I think that like we all can do a better job of like celebrating that we all have different experiences, whether it's like someone who consumes Soylent or someone who tried on 10 different shirts before they decide what to wear. <laughs> Some of us have different ways of expressing ourselves. So I think that was like really cool that you brought that up. I think that developers are starting to get it, but I see that it's like at the management level, the people who are enforcing the times that we work, what we have to work on that like need to also have like a sort of culture change. What are some things that we can do to push that? Whether it's like, you know, training ourselves and our coworkers to not use male gender pronouns to describe engineers or anything like that. Like, um, I think that the best thing that we can do is to continue to be ourselves authentically. Because we all are different, we are diverse, that's just a fact. And it's a fact that nobody with whatever legacy view can deny. Um, and, and when they try, they'll constantly be faced with the reality of diversity. Okay. So you mentioned uh, in the beginning the Java, JavaScript. You know, it's something that like, I still hear today. I was originally a Java developer. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry. I guess like, I, I actually love Java. It has the best tooling out of all the languages, so don't at me. Uh, so I guess like Netscape had like named JavaScript to sort of ride off of like Java at the time being like the most popular web programming language. Right. So what do you think like the next like new language that someone's spending seven days building like will name like JavaScript like after JavaScript? Probably like, JavaScript script. I'm thinking, yeah, I was thinking JavaScript script or like JavaScript programming language, one word. <laughs> like just sort of build off of that. They'll probably, I think the next big language is going to be a single letter. Okay. Yeah. R maybe? Yeah, maybe R or P <laughs> or Q. Yeah, okay. <laughs> cool. So um, I am a big fan of RxJS. I know a lot of people work on it and contribute to it. I don't know if you know that an algorithm I wrote, Jort Sort, is implemented in RxJS. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, you can use rx.observable.jortsort. Uh, Super yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So uh, thank you so much for giving a well-rounded uh, talk. Uh -huh. uh, give another round of applause for Jeremy. Thank you.